All right. Um, hi, everybody. This is uh, the Drupal Starshot session for uh, Drupal on the Edge on July 10th, uh, 2024. And we have a couple updates, I guess, from the Starshot leadership side. Uh, we are gearing up to announce the Starshot Council, which had the first meeting last month, and we'll have the second meeting tomorrow. So we're already getting a lot of good feedback from all kinds of different people on what we are doing and how we should be refining that. It's great. I think it's a new interesting model of the development of Drupal when we are getting direct feedback from people that would use it and um, agencies that would build stuff with it, etc. I think that's great. We've also been at Drupal Dev Days the week, uh, I think two weeks ago in Burgas. Uh, we did a keynote with Larry on Starshot and source the slides. So if you go to slash Starshot, there's a marketing menu item and you can use the open source slides from there. We have basically an overview of Starshot uh, in that deck. We are still awaiting the recording from that session, but when the recording comes in, we'll publish all the slides and the recording together so that it's easier to reproduce as a session for yourself. So if you have want to do sessions at your company, meetup, um, whatever, then that's a good basis for introducing Starshot to your colleagues or local community. I think we built up a good story for uh people within the Drupal community to understand it better the components and where each things are and also something that we're working on this week is to expand more of the Starshot tracks stuff that we think is a must-have for Starshot things that should work on for uh this year especially before DrupalCon Barcelona where we hope to have a, an initial version shown one of the things that made a lot of progress recently is the Drupal on the edge or at the edge um, initiative that Matt is leading. So I will give the mic over to Matt and feel free to chat in the chats and post your questions in the Q&A. And we'll have a discussion uh, when Matt introduced the initiative. All right. All yours. Hey, everyone. Let me get my slides shared really quick. All right, thanks for joining. So we're gonna talk about Drupal at the edge with WebAssembly. And just to kind of explain like what that means, it's like on the edge just ties into edge computing. I don't, it's like the new catchphrase a lot of people are using. Cloudflare really captured a lot of this by allowing them to run, by allowing you to run certain code at the edge of the CDN. So really close to the uh, user in their browser. And that's what edge computing is all about. It's just taking processes and running them closer to where they need to be, like in the CDN, directly in the user's browser. Um, and in that regard, we have WebAssembly, and that supports edge computing by running applications in browsers. If you haven't heard of WebAssembly, it's been around for a bit. It has some precursors, but it allows you to take C code, Rust, Golang, other, other languages, and compile them into a binary format that browsers understand and execute. So the browser is the runtime, no other software. Um, so that means if you want to run Drupal, you don't need Apache or PHP. Well, you need PHP, but compiled as WebAssembly. But the browser becomes the web server and PHP is executed inside of the web server. And you don't need to have DDEV or a Docker solution locally to run things or another server. And so that ties into like, why are we doing this? Like that sounds really neat about edge computing um, but how does that tie in with Drupal? And the first takeaway is if you watch the Dries node at Portland, there's that cool little button that said launch next to this wireframe mock of Drupal.org. I know when I saw that, like I lit up, I was like, Hey, I know how we can do that. This is going to be great. Um, and that, that's the why. So it allows everyone, it allow everyone a chance to try Drupal with a click of a button without following the quick start command where you have PHP locally on your host or inside Docker, all these other things. Um, and I think it's also going to unlock other innovative solutions. Like I am formulating ideas on how someone might be able to use a Drupal build that they put in WebAssembly. And then that's how authors work with their Drupal site and stage content via workspaces. So the starting point is this launch, but I'm really excited to see where 
organizations take this and create some really innovative ideas. I don't think we have to just stop here, but it's a great point to like learn lessons and keep moving forward. So the why for now is launching and tying out Drupal. So let's go check out the demo uh, that we have running so far. So it is available at wasm-drupal.mglomin.dev. I'll go ahead and I'm gonna copy this into the chat for anybody that wants to just go ahead and try it out. So to just show you how it really works, I'm gonna go ahead and open DevTools just so you can see the whole gambit. Um, so to start, we're gonna actually just gonna install Drupal itself. So when I click install, it's going to download all the required extensions and it actually it's downloading a Drupal archive and it's extracting it into the browser. Now inside, oh, we'll wait for it to refresh. So it actually downloaded pretty fast because it's cached on my end. And it's doing a cold boot at the moment, which is probably the slowest part of this at the moment. And I'd like to find a way to speed it up. But once this refreshes, we'll end up with a fully loaded Drupal instance. There we go. So if I go back to my dev tools, we can see that Drupal is actually installed onto the browser's IndexedDB data store. So this has all the files available and that's where everything is being served from. So I can go ahead and log in with the default of admin and admin. And now we are inside of Drupal running inside the browser. And just to help verify, I'll go to the status report and we're gonna look up the PHP information. So you can see here, the system, it says Inscriptin. So Inscriptin is a tool that allows you to compile C code to, to Wasm. So if you've ever worked with Rust, there's actually a way to compile Rust directly to WebAssembly. Um, same with Golang. But if you have a C-based application, you use Inscriptin to do so. So there is the PHP Wasm package and that takes the PHP source code along with extensions and compiles them with Inscriptin so they can be used in the browser. And with this fully functioning site, you're able to click around and test things out. Um, there we go. There is this one bug that I'm trying to sort out where the session gets lost after about a minute and only, and it usually fixes itself when you refresh the page. Um, so yeah, so we're in here. And one of the benefits of evaluating this is you could come in and let's say that you haven't tried out the new navigation module that's in core. So you could come here, install those. So yes, I want to continue. Wait for it to finish its operations. And you'll be able to test out these modules without having to clone the latest development snapshot of Drupal or anything of that sort. Um, this does not allow adding custom modules yet. That is something I want to add into the roadmap. Now to go back, there aren't any controls that you get back easily. So you just gotta, we'll purge this and go back to the main page. It checks if you have an instance running, which allows you to reset it and delete the contents. Now let's go ahead and um, click install for Starshot. Now this again is gonna download an archive and install um, is it a fully sandbox in that tab? So it's not just that tab. So if I go to, so if I were to go back to CGI Drupal, oh wait, I'm not on localhost. Hold on a second. So if I go back to that URL, it will be, it will load back that site. So it's not sandbox per tab, but let's say sandbox per browser. So if I were to open Firefox on my machine, it wouldn't exist. Um, if I open an incognito, I think it still exists, but if you did it in a browser tab, oh, okay. So don't try to do both things at once. It's not gonna end up well. Um, so if, I op if you open like in a private browsing tab and were to close it, that would clear out all the data. So then that would be like sandbox per tab, um, but the data persists inside of the browser. And now I'm afraid that I may have broke this by trying to access both things at the same time. Um, so that's one thing to note. It does have memory limits built in. 
and we'll see if I did not completely just break the environment. But when you when you do this on your side, you don't have both things trying to run at the same time. You will get to see the prototype of Starshot. And actually, let's go ahead and see if I can just clear this out. One second. All right. Let's just do a reset there. So again, the, the Starshot archive is a bit bigger. Um, so it takes a little bit longer to load because it does have some default images. Um, there is some work going on to display this percentage inside the button so that way it's more obvious as to what's happening or that the redirection is happening, is occurring. So while we wait for that to load, I'm gonna scoot over to what's on the roadmap. So it's not, it's not perfect yet. Um, so we're missing some PHP extensions like OpCache. Uh, we were missing WebP support with the GD module, but that was added. So things like OpCache and APCU, that again requires taking those extensions and recompiling them via mscripten, not just the default um, binaries. Yes, when you hover over, it will say the memory used, but it's not right now. Um, probably because that's loading. Uh, if you have Safari, there is a bug in PHP CGI Wasm. So the way that this works is there's two versions of PHP running. When we're on this page and building it, it's actually using PHP to extract the archive. But the trick to make this work is there's a service worker that's intercepting all the, ape, all the requests. So if we click on, so if I click on launch, we can see here that everything's coming from the service worker. That's actually intercepting all these requests and then passing it to the PHP WebAssembly binary and executing the PHP code or loading it from the file system. And that service worker is acting like a CGI, like PHP FPM, where it's kind of in the background handling requests and forwarding the response. That is broken in Safari and I have no idea why. So that's gonna involve taking like a development build that's not um, that actually has like symbols in place so we can see where it's breaking. And then another feature that I want to add, we'd like to have added is allowing exporting the code in database so you can use it locally with DDEV and possibly even hosting providers. So that way if you were to come in here and customize this content and add some items or configure it, you're like, I like this, that way you could take it with you and there could be like an export button that allows you to take it off. Um, and that's completely feasible because I'll actually show you the demo from Sean Morris, the PHP Wasm. So there's originally a demo using Drupal 7. And let's see if I can just quick, do, we'll boot up the Drupal 7 one. And while this loads. So this Drupal 8 required a little bit more work, but it's with this package, they had Drupal 7 work running. But the really interesting part is that there is a backup, like this is where we can use PHP to actually archive the environment and give you the code. Or Sean Morris has got VS code running in WebAssembly and that's something we can also borrow as well. So we could give like an inline way to edit your browser's file system, which is this area right here, to modify the code and test a few things out. So there's a lot that we can do and I've been collaborating with Sean Morris to see how we can start contributing to the WebAssembly package and start leveraging some items like this. So again, lots that we can do, but the bare, the initial start is just let's launch and be able to take it with you. So that way in case you really like what you created, you don't have to redo it once you have it locally. So let's talk about how you can join in. If this is really interesting, um, there's a few ways you can join in and there's two specific spots. So uh, these are both repositories on GitHub at mglomin slash wasm dash Drupal. That is the code base for this user interface, which is mostly just integrating PHP wasm and launching some of these items. I will share the link after to these slides. 
Um, so if you want to help and contribute to this user interface, such as add, I have work that adds everything in an iframe. So we can have a toolbar at the top for an action bar or one that slides out. Um, or if you want to improve the default archive, I've worked to originally the Drupal archive was like 32 megabytes, but I added some, I, I did some work and got it down to 20 megabytes. 4.4 is the default database installed with it. So if you want to help optimize there, or if you know some C code, you could help contribute to the actual PHP WASM repo, uh, Sean Moore slash PHP dash WASM. This contains PHP WASM and PHP CGI WASM. That's where we could add opcache support compiling APCU. And one thing that is missing is fiber support. So Drupal, a few months ago or some time ago, I had this wild blog post that said, hey, what if you use fibers to asynchronously render placeholders? And then it got it was added into Drupal core. Um, it was added in Drupal core for big pipe and also the rendering system as a whole. But unfortunately, fiber support yet is, is not yet added to PHP. I believe there'd be a handful of custom work we have to do and scripting supports async code. Um, it actually supports threading via the, the V8 JavaScript engine inside browsers. We just need to build that support for PHP's asynchronous fiber support into that as well. So again, if, if you know C code or are willing to learn, that is an area that we could use some help in jumping in. Um, same with if you find odd bugs. Um, if I were to go back to, let's go back to the Starshot instance while that loads. PHP, if you get there, so PHP warns or Drupal warns that PHP is using 32 int times. So it has the year 2038 problem. If you're not familiar with that, the timestamps break if it's past year two, 2038. So we need to re get the PHP WASM library updated to support that. And that's an area for jumping in as well. Um, here's one also that would be great to debug. The Starshot demo throws errors about two meter redirects when you log in or submit a form. Again, that's an area of contribution that would be helpful and that you can do locally. So I should have pulled that up ahead of time. Um, but again, oh, composer's not found. Oh, because this is the upgrade of the update module installed on it. Um, limited date range. It's like this is this is about the way that PHP is compiled. It's like that's something that can be fixed upstream. Um, and that's one just always feel free to open an issue and ask and I can help you redirect you the right way. If you want to run it locally, there are steps here. If you have DDEV, um, Nick was nice enough to contribute adding DDEV. So you can just do DDEV start, DDEV make build, that will build everything and then you can access it th through DDEV. Or if you don't have Docker, you can just run these two commands. And that way you can work with it locally, test it out, um, be able to try out different things with PHP WASM as well. And that's where we are now. I'm hoping that, well, not hoping, but by DrupalCon Barcelona for the official session where I'll be talking about this more in depth. We will have ways to export your code. I'd love to have the VS code item added. So maybe you could test writing a custom module in the browser as well and executing Drush or Composer commands. So that way we could add modules dynamically to the code base or prefer certain Drush operations as well. That's and same. that leads to one of the first questions is that, could you add Project Browser to this? Would it work? So we'll see. Um, so the file system is completely writable. It's a writable file system and composers bundled. Um, one issue is that when I archived, when I have the archive set up, I'm ignoring the vendor bin directory, which is why project browser or automatic updates was complaining that composer couldn't be found because the binary was excluded from the archive. So I think that could work. I think project browser could work and we could get an instance up and running fairly certain. I actually am not entirely sure what's bundled in the prototype at the moment. Um, I don't believe project Bro is project browser in the prototype already, or is it just automatic updates? I don't think it is now. Okay. No, it's not. But it's so like... that could be something that we try out. 
Great. Um, the next question is, have you or anyone tried running this in a low power device like a Chromebook? How much system memory does this require? And also CPU, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't done a lot of tested testing. Um, but I'll tell you what, after working on it locally, I then tried to show it to my wife when we were at a baseball game and I instantly regretted it, but that's before it was a much smaller archive size. So I do have a pixel seven and it took a while to, I had low service and it took quite a bit to download the archive. That's when it was still 32 megs and not 20, that 12 does make a difference. Um, also, as part of that downsizing, it reduced the number of files, and it seems to have made it faster. You know, on my, on my Pixel 7, it, it still took about twice as long as what we had, ex we experienced on this call. So I'm not entirely sure what the impact will be on low power devices, but it should be a one-time cost because it should be cached then. Like, things will be cached. So the first time you do it, it will kind of hurt. But if you don't delete your instance, you will have it there in your device um yeah so I, there, that's that's one part too if somebody wants to do the testing and see like what that what are the actual usage numbers and report them we can always try to improve that and make it faster i'm not sure how but it's something that we can at least work towards yeah nora said in in chat that they ran it on a chromebook just now and the basic drupal install happened quickly they're running google chrome os version 126 Official build with four gigs of RAM. And they're trying yeah, on. I'm less worried about Chromebooks, but phones. Phones are the ones I'd be more worried about, especially over mobile data. Is the um oh yeah, and that's one thing to note too. That's there should be I need somebody suggested adding warnings, and I may do that for mobile because the, the WebAssembly files are like twelve or thirteen megabytes themselves. And there's I don't think there's a way to optimize that at all. Like that's compiled PHP. So when you hit the page, you are downloading a 13 megabyte file and then also 20 megabyte archive. And that can add to the data over a mobile network. But I don't know how many people will necessarily be doing that, but that is something to be aware of. Yeah, Rad, Radchab mentioned in chat that Project Browser adds 70, 70 megabytes, I think, to files and 70 to database. I think that's an artifact of how it's done currently with the oh. it's a database dump of the project list. But yeah, because it doesn't very, have an API yet. Yeah, very recently the DA rolled out the, or is rolling out the backend API to basically live access the API on Drupal.org. And that will mean that the dump of the project list will not be in Project Browser. So that should reduce the dramatically the size of Project Browser. Um all right. Next question is does the reset button remove data from index db and the service worker? Yes. So this should tie into the other question that I, I did zip through resetting fairly quickly. So we have inside of our application. So I'll walk through also some of the debugging of it. So it's a service worker, and you can see the service worker from the service workers tab. As a note, this is Brave which is a Blink-based browser like Chrome, it's going to look a lot different in Firefox and even far different in Safari. So just as a caveat, um, Firefox, I can't remember the exact steps, but it's somewhat similar. I think service workers are in one tab and then index DB is in like a storage tab. So the mscripting creates a config and a persist file system. There's file data here. Click and reset will call this to be deleted and then refresh the page. Um, a lot of times you have to click refresh here because it doesn't automatically refresh. So now the data is gone, but let's say that you are in a hard broken site or you're testing it and things went completely wrong. Like I had happen. You're able to actually go and delete the databases manually. But if you choose to do this, to do like a hard, hard reset, you have to unregister the service worker. Otherwise things just, it, it errors out. And then you refresh the page, it re-registers and creates the databases and you're back on the way. These should be documented on the readme as well. This is one reason I kind of went through it because it's like an edge case. But the reset button should always fix it for you. But if not, you can go in, manually delete the, manually delete the databases, 
unregister the service worker and go back to square run one. But that should right. be in the readme. Yeah, uh, but it will persist in your browser for like however long it is there. For, I don't, is there like a limit forever. of forever. Just forever. Um, it, it'll last forever till you clear the site data, as far as I understand it all. I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know of any instances. I have a family member that works for a, a, a big company and they moved their classic like software distribution model to using WebAssembly over the browser. And they, mm -hmm. they haven't had issues and they use it for like a CAD software. And so it, it stays until you clear all your data or if uh, you like deleted the browser, then it would be gone, I'm assuming. Yeah. But otherwise it's, yeah. it sticks around. Great. Um, so Will says that they see the use of this for spinning up ephemeral QAB health environments. Have you thought about that? That I have not. Um, but that's uh, part of the thing that was going back in my brain is as like the main contributor to Simply Test Me. I was like, all right, are we going to leverage Simply Test Me? Because whew, that's going to be a lot if everybody's using it. Or are we going to use WebAssembly? And now it's thinking, okay, how can we make this more scalable? I would say if you want to do ephemeral QA, be hat environments, or even just ephemeral environments, period, the biggest hurdle is that you're archiving your, your code base, and then you need to make it extracted into the browser itself. Um, so since we have some time, I'll just show what that looks like. So under the hood, here's how it's all working. So I'll go find the public file. Let's see if it will be clean up launch. So when you click launch, it's going to go ahead and I'm going to zoom in one more. So it takes that artifact and it downloads it in memory and then writes it to the file system itself. So that would be like the one ugh, downside is that you need to for your QA environment, basically do a composer archive of your build and database, or maybe not database. If you can run drush commands, cool, because then you could just do the, the Drupal site and then run drush via Wasm. It downloads the, the artifact and then puts that zip file into the file system itself. And then it takes this PHP code and executes it. And here we'll load that PHP code, that PHP code opens that artifact and then writes it to the disk. So we're, it's inefficient and I'm hoping, and I'll explain why we have to do this way in a second. So it downloads the archive from the server, puts it into the file system of the browser and then executes PHP code to unzip the archive. So that way all the files are available. The reason we have to do this with mscripten, you can add preloaded data but their system uses XML HTTP requests, which are deprecated in favor of fetch, like fetch methods, and, and service workers only support fetch. So you cannot use XML HTTP requests inside of a service worker, which prevents us from compiling PHP, like PHP Wasm with the preloaded data or asking it to take this preloaded data and doing this workaround with the zip archive um, one thing of note for Sean Morris with the PHP Wasm, he does have a Discord channel and we've been chatting in there and he's been contributing to mscripten. I cannot recall if he found, if he has patches that will fix that or not, but I think so. It's just, there's a lot of internal code that has to be fixed inside mscripten to fix the usage of XML HTTP requests, which are synchronous versus fetch, which is asynchronous. So because of that, detail that's why we have this weird dance of download an, an, a zip archive put it into the file system and then extract it and it's kind of like this wasteful work if we could get the preloaded data to work well with service workers again because the service worker is emulating like a cgi process then you could preload that data and this could be a lot simpler and that could make it a lot easier to do ephemeral data or do better on-demand builds so on-demand builds that could be launched into Wasm because you just need to say, hey, here's the preloaded data, go download it, and we're, we're all set. That would also speed it up, I think, right? Because you wouldn't need to like yes. do it. 
like that would help a lot with especially bigger packages. Yes. So I think that that we can get to the history of this a bit and like highlight. So like there was the Drupal seven wasn't thing, which is the original, basically the original how how it was done, and then uh, the WordPress people found that and they made it much better for their thing. So they have a WordPress playground and they support loading from a zip file or loading from a GitHub repo, that kind of stuff. So basically they are selling WordPress playground as a thing to like try out patches of WordPress or like the, all kinds of like the manual QA, that kind of thing. Uh, so they can import from GitHub and do other kinds of things or get a pull request from GitHub. So they can like work on testing a pull request from their code base. So it works similar to simply test that me trying out a patch or the Drupal uh, integration with um, Gitpod. So Drupalpod could also basically transition to this potentially. So there's other opportunities here, I think, that if it works out, then it could be a bunch of potential there as well for developers, yeah. just for uh, end users. And then when I talked about rendering in an iframe to add like a toolbar, it's something of this. I'm actually not too uh, big of a fan of this necessarily. I would like if it was more of like a sidebar action, but it's one that that way you could come in, maybe pick a different PHP version. This requires more compilation right now, which is PHP 8.3 um, and maybe trying to do like 11.x.dev. Um, let's see if we go back, I I was hoping there'd be a lot we could use from the WordPress playground, but unfortunately there was not a lot to do or that could be used because they took their packages and made it like, there's micro package management all over the place, um, which yeah. is great if you have that tooling set up, but it made it really hard to reuse, but they have all these different compiled versions of PHP and WordPress available. So, that is something that we could get to where we can have ways to do automated builds. Um, maybe once this moves on to Drupal.org infrastructure, or actually I'm not sure what the next step will be because right now it's, you know, it's on my AWS account in S3 with my GitHub repo and we're, mm -hmm. we're figuring out. But then once we move to like a more complex build system, there, maybe there's ways to package snapshots of 11.x every commit or every nightly, things of that sort. Um, the Starshot demo right now, for example, is a to compile it. I have to run a manual action, which checks out the prototype and builds it. I'm supposed to have a pull request up to the prototype so it gets built there and we download it from GitHub automatically. So that way, every time that the prototype is updated, this tr this install will be using the latest of the prototype, not some snapshot in time. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where we have lots of ways to grow and expand on it. Yeah, we have, uh, I guess, Neil Drum and Brendan from the DA on the list of people. I don't want to put them on the spot, but I think the ultimate goal for this is, the, as you've said at the presentation, is the launch button for demoing Drupal and the like. The faster we can make the faster the the operation of the launch button the faster we can make it the better than way that way you can get like a way better experience than the tri drupal experience as it is right now on drupal.org uh, which is more of a tri hosting experience i think it could be a separate thing of once you now you try drupal then you can try hosting um so let's go back to the questions because there's more so Dallas says that, Matt, I appreciated your blog post about Drupal at the Edge. So beyond that, from a marketing perspective, how do you envision the unique value proposition of Drupal on the Edge being communicated to different personas such as developers, content creators, and marketers? In your opinion, what are specific features or benefits we should highlight for each group? So this is very much, I would say, for developers to, to try for developers and let's say marketers, I don't even know if it might be content creators, but just like, oh, this Drupal thing, I need to try it out. 
So that way they can just get their hands on it, which is, I feel like the WordPress playground is very developer-y. Um, and that's mm -hmm. where I would like to, I would like ours to feel more for like the content creator. Like it's a developer tool in a way that it's kind of, it's nerdy, it's neat, but it'd be great to make this interface a bit more friendly to a marketer or like a, a site builder where, oh, I created this and oh, I actually really like this. I wish I could take it with me. Um, for those who don't know my backstory, I got started with Commerce Kickstart before I even knew it was Drupal. And like, I built something cool with the demo and that's back in those days, you couldn't just take the demo out. Like you had to start from scratch. So something of that sort where it lets people that aren't developers try it out. It's so like, oh, I get this Drupal thing. Or people who are new developers, the site builder persona, that like in between, where they can do download a zip and export. Um, and maybe there's like a toggle that gives you like some of the developer options. Like, hey, I'd like to open a merge request for this, like how they kind of have it in. But I'd like to hide a bit more of those and have this initial launch look like a, I need to try out Drupal. What is this? And get rid of that, oh, it's just for developers persona. Now, personally, I think it is one of the best application frameworks, but our target persona isn't that. Um, but people can find that out on their own. So let's target that end user that wants the no frills. It just works and I can try it out. After that, that's just from the launch button. After that, I'm imagining, I know there's some agencies doing some really, really, really cool things and wild things with Drupal. So I want this to help set up the, gra the, the groundwork for, was it like to take your Drupal build and put it into a Wasm runtime? What are the tips and tricks needed to do so, so that we can unlock all that innovation and creativity and create that hype? So that's one thing I want to do too, is like have this be hyped up because everybody else hypes up their projects. This is pretty darn cool. And I think the Drupal community is gonna do some really innovative stuff with it once we have this baseline down and others see how they can do it also. It's super cool. Actually, so that leads into the next question that was both, I guess, alluded to in chat and asked in Q&A. And one of, my, one of my favorite side effects of this, I guess, if this succeeds on Drupal.org, then it makes it super easy to get started with Drupal and then it puts the hosting providers uh, to like up on the up on the stage of like how do you make your process simple to like now how do I take this to a hosting provider? So that's what Nora is asking that on the Drupal at the Edge landing page we have you will be able to export your code and database to hosting provider of your choice to go further. Is that functionally currently available? Um, no, it is not. So I do have, so on the GitHub, I've tried to preload issues um, and I should create another label that highlights like the ability to export, um, but, or a milestone. Um, I'll probably create a milestone called export or exportability, who knows, take it with you if you want it. The first step is DDEV. Like let's get it so that there's DDEV available. Um, the code base should be really easy to do. Actually, no, there's challenges here for all of this. Let's start with the database because actually that's easier. The database is using SQLite. There isn't an easy way to convert SQLite to MySQL. And I don't think we want to be running MySQL in Wasm. I mean, maybe we could, but this is the easier way. Drupal does have a script that actually lets you export your database as PHP code. That's how test fixtures work. So maybe we could do that and there's some way in there. So the first part might be exporting a Drupal code, exporting the Drupal database, and then you can just do composer create locally and import it with DDEV via some command. The code base, the code base one is a bit harder. And that's because the Drupal code base that's in the runtime is patched. And that's where it might not be a way to just export it. You might need to create a new project and we provide the steps for it. There's two things that there's several things being patched here. One, get attributes to remove, to reduce the size of the archive. Maybe this could be changed. Maybe this could be done in the build pipeline and not actually committed. The calls to INI set around cookies are commented out inside the Drupal kernel because this prevents it from breaking. Um, otherwise the sessions don't work and you can't log in. Um, maybe this isn't needed. I copied from Drupal 7 and I needed it a year ago when I couldn't get it to work previously. So just so everybody knows, I tried this last year and it kind of just sat because 
I didn't see, it was neat, but what was the point? Um, and I needed this to get cookies to work last time. And then there's the patch to revert the fiber support in the renderer service. So it'd be really hard to just export the code base as it is because it's not a, it's not one that I would put into production because it wouldn't work locally or it like with the INI set removals, it wouldn't work. And then this is a regression that we're not leveraging fibers for placeholder rendering. So that's part of the issue there. Um, so if you want to follow 10 and 11 inside the repo, uh, I think that getting the database will work easy or we have a solution there. It may not be elegant, but we can at least start there and getting the code base out could be harder, but luckily right now you can't add custom modules. So it's just saying, Hey, go composer, create Drupal recommended project or download the Starshot prototype and then import the database. So those are the two steps there. Um, and again, we're moving towards that point. There's just been a handful of issues I've been trying to take care of first. Um, but by Barcelona, which is in what, two months already, I believe we'll be, yep. we'll be there and working examples of exporting to DDEV and think of it as going, let's say agile. We're taking baby steps. We're learning. Once we see what that looks like, then we can see what it's like to export to a hosting provider because let's face it, as far as I know with all the hosting providers, you can't precede off a database. I mean, digital ocean and things like that have like templates, but that doesn't even precede from a database. So there's things that we'll have to figure out and sit down. If this, by having the DDEV stuff ready by Barcelona, that's a chance to sit down with people and actually talk of what it could look like integrating with hosting providers in person. So that'd be a great thing to discuss in Barcelona. Yeah, it would, net, would potentially require changes on the hosting provider side as well, or like some kind of endpoint that you can give the code in the database. Um, so I think John Picosi says that this is great. However, it feels very much like a dev tool. I think it's a, this is the first version that works that's public. So that that's why. Uh, and he says that the DDL launch button has to be geared to no code, low code users. We need some UI and testing before just putting this on Drupal.org. And I think that's what Matt is explaining in this session. Yes. Yeah. But this follow up point is a great one that I was considering also. You created something cool in your browser mm -hmm. and you want to share it and you can't because they don't have that accessible. Um, but as we saw with the, uh, let me pull it up again. So that's one where we go in here, this backup button. Oh, neat. Didn't work. Um, where if you could, if there was a way that you could say backup and like give somebody a smart link and it knew how to like pre-install it, there, there might be solutions, but that would be a caveat. And that might be one hard to explain that, Hey, I have this instance, you copy the URL and share it to somebody and they go, I don't see anything here. Um, that will be an interesting problem to try to solve. Yeah. If you have like a place to put up the database copy and everything, and then they could, another person could have their own instance of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then Aaron says that they could see another use case as some sort of decoupled situation where you don't need to worry about maintaining hosting for both Drupal and your static assets, just cheap hosting for your build artifacts. And you're building from here, I guess. Maybe. <laughs> that's a lot of trust Maybe in because... the thing in your browser, I think, that stays there forever, yes. Yeah, because actually here's, uh, I, since I delete everything, there's a problem um, where if you go try to JSON API, it downloads the JSON file. Um, although I guess that's not entirely this, like you could, yeah, I guess if you were like using Tome, okay, let's use an example here. Again, like innovation ideas. Tome is, allows you to take your Drupal site and export it to a static build. Yes, you could have authoring on the edge where every author is just running it in their browser and they click a button and that creates a pull request that stages their static content output, things like that. And that is where I, I want to help set the baseline with this so we can see that kind of innovation where we could have ideas like that start cropping up. And it is feasible. It's just people 
need to start experimenting once we get this baseline set so they see how easily they can reproduce it. Yeah, uh, Sarah asked where can we find the issues that we, I think you went to the basically your GitHub issue list is where you preceded a bunch of these issues that you mentioned. And also Sarah asked where can we access the recording of this talk that will be on drupal.org slash starshot in a couple of days when like Zoom produces the video and then we cut the video, we put it on YouTube and then we put it on drupal.org slash starshot. So there's a few steps there that involve humans. Um, so as soon as we get through all of those steps that will be there. Yeah. And um, I, I would say for the issues, GitHub lets you pin three issues. So the three items that are, I'm always going to try to keep this up to date would seem like the hot items or like what are most important to follow. They might also be the hardest to contribute to, but I am going to try to put issues in here and including things that are related to PHP WASM, instead of just saying, oh, go look at that issue queue. I want to track things related to us in this issue, and then we can see how to collaborate onto that project. Great. Uh, and then Rechap says that if we have it similar to the WordPress Playground kind of approach, then marketers could get demos of things with this. Explorers could get test drives of features and then they could test modules, recipes, or themes. Uh, could this support integrating with country modules at some point themes and recipes to quickly show them? Or would people need to host their own thing? I don't think they so would need. The hosting, you don't even need a cheap, I mean, by cheap host. Um, this thing is on S3 with a cloud front distribution in front of it. So like it's, it's, you could host this probably with Cloudflare CDN. Um, you could host this on any static file host. Like you don't need a, a true server for this. You can do it however you want. Um, oh shoot, where'd it go? I was gonna try to read the other part of it, it disappeared. There it is. Um, so the interesting part would be for module testing, recipes testing, Module testing requires adding, so modules, theme, re recipes, and themes. If we can get Composer working inside Wasm and say, yes, I want to add a module to this environment or an extension, that would be awesome. Um, rest, I know recipes aren't the new distributions, but they, they kind of are. Um, there is, and again, in this make file, I try to outline all the build steps. So Drupal build, it goes into the directory and runs Composer install. There could be, we could have these workflows that say, all right, um, I can't even think of like what's a modern, open social. Yeah, okay, let's take open social because that is a distro. Open social could have a build that creates the archive and uploads it somewhere. And then the playground could know, could know where that zip file is and say, great, we will download the zip file, extract it, and you can run open social in the browser. So there are ways that we can do this. And I think it's not even technical issues. It's probably just more documentation and being aware that it's that simple of put up an archive, make sure it's downloadable and we can run it. In the end, it, it can be that simple and then turn that into like a more scalable solution, but also in that's and about security. If anybody's wondering with it, WebAssembly is pretty sandboxed. And I was reading about this before that even if we were to take a random archive and extract it, run some PHP code, it's completely sandboxed. So I don't think there'd be issues there, but that's one where we'd want like trusted sources of where they're being downloaded from and not just third-party URLs. Yeah. Uh, so we're running out of time, but we have one more question from James Shields. Uh, he says, love this. Do you think we could make it create something a Drupal hobbyist could download and install in a cheap web host? It's one of the questions. And the other end of the scale, could we make it export the config and sync to a GitHub repo? Yes. So one that's so on a cheap web host, like I said, S3, you're good to go. Or like DigitalOcean has their app platform, which lets you host static files for free. Netlify, Vercel, all have free static file hosting. You throw it up there and you're good to go. I think the question was more about like you do like a Drupal site and then you export the Drupal site out of this and put it on a cheap host. I think that was the question. Oh, that. So that, yes, that is the next step. Sorry. If the idea is that they create something here, download it and install it on a cheap host, that's the next step after DDEV. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, on a cheap host, if you had Caddy and use SQLite, 
I, I know you can, I've, I've done testing and for a $5 dropout on digital ocean using caddy and SQLite, you can host a highly performant Drupal site, like with that unauthenticated traffic. So like that, that's an option, but that's bespoke and not the main hosting platforms people are using. Um, one thing I have been considering is export in sync to a GitHub repo. We have a PHP script. We have a, you can do OAuth. Um, every hosting provider integrates with repos. So that's what I've been considering is the way to integrate with hosting providers is you click export to GitHub and then it writes to a GitHub repo for you. Um, so there's, that's one idea I've had in my head as well, but I'm trying to not be your typical developer on this or I would chase every shiny option, but just trying to get the best value delivered and then keep those ideas. I should write it down um, on how we can do the bigger options or bigger features once we're ready for them. Yeah, I think it, this provides a lot of amazing opportunity. Um, so if we can make this run very easy on Drupal.org for people trying out Drupal and they have an easy way to take it and host it, then it should simplify getting started with Drupal a whole lot. And if we can make it work with Composer, then we can run the whole of Starshot and you could use recipes and the whole project browser installer in there and all of that, that's even better. So, uh, and then all the advanced options beyond that are, are also amazing. So I'm, I'm glad that this basically calls for all kinds of audiences, um, but it's also the key goal here is to solve the problem of getting started with Drupal is hard and you just get a button in the browser and it works. It's great. Um, so thank you for doing this. We run out of time. Uh, so we'll post the recording of this when it becomes available on drupal.org slash starshot. And you can reach Matt on Drupal Slack as well, I think, and on the issue queue of Wes and Drupal on everywhere on socials as well. Yep. And I dropped links. If you want to open issues or discussions on GitHub, feel free or ping me in the Starshot channel. I don't want to make a dedicated channel just for the WebAssembly stuff. I'd like to keep it in Starshot. Um, so that way we have a cohesive conversation. Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. And thanks everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you, everyone.